Here comes Vernon Roth from West Cliff, Colorado, which is one of the most beautiful towns I've ever experienced. He's a professional researcher. He's gone into uh, ancient technology and languages, very, very deep knowledge. He's worked with alternative technology in medical areas. He got into this basically to help heal his daughter, and he just ran with it, and he's built up some amazing material in the past few years. He's working to make ideal technology into real-world technology. He's also studied codes in the Bible, different types of research like that. And he says that one thing that's helped him, and this might be a clue for some of us, one thing that's helped him with his research is he processes knowledge as patterns and movements. And that's a very, very interesting way to go at it. So here's Vernon Roth. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I put this up instead of an introductory page because in a lot of our research, we have found that shapes and um, patterns affect how your mind works. And I wanted to set a certain tone with, with what we're talking about here today. And this is a picture by a friend of mine. It's original artwork, and it's, it's, it's absolutely quite beautiful. It actually portrays the spiral patterns that come out of black holes, um, and I'll talk about the references. It's, it portrays the energy that flows out of black holes and actually permeates the Earth as the Earth moves through the universe and, <clears throat> excuse me, and rotates. This energy actually comes down to us and all living things on the planet. So I wanted you to th be thinking about that as we started this, uh, this presentation today. All right. Now, I've never talked about a, a, a subject that is really more controversial or, or, in my opinion, more misunderstood than the Joe Cell technology. And I wanted to talk about, first off, there aren't a whole lot of people here that are, that are actually doing research in this, so I wanted to touch on uh, what this is all about real quick before we go on. Uh, Joe Cell technology was originally discovered in about the 90s, uh, so about uh, 15, 16 years ago, and it was used to run a car, essentially. And what we have is a researcher that found a way to run a vehicle utilizing a, a set, a uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a set of concentric rings, or set, set of concentric tubes, and generated some type of, not physical gas, but an energy that appeared to run the vehicle. Now, no, I have never been to Australia, and I have never actually seen a, a vehicle work on it. But I got into this kind of serendipitously because I was researching energy, and energy and health, and, and how health affects the, or how energy affects the body. And I was led to the Joe Cell technology. So when you go out there and uh, shock yourself with our shocking water on the table, remember that as um, we were perfecting this, there were, there were three books on the table. One was Alex Schiffer's book from uh, Australia on Joe Cell technology. The next one was Peter Lindemann's book on cold electricity. And the third one we won't get into. But <clears throat> as we move into this, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about what, why this has been brought to the forefront right now. This work was being done in Australia for a number of years, and there wasn't a huge amount of success with it until just recently, apparently, a, a gentleman here in the United States, the only person that apparently has been able to make it operate here in the United States, was actually running his truck on it, and it made a truck, his older pickup truck, run much, much differently than it was designed to. Let's just put it that way. The information is out there. It's, it's, really, um, it's really out there. And so if you, find, if, if you want to research this, then please feel free to go ahead. It's, um, it, it's really interesting and will uh, illuminate the subject greatly. But apparently, as the story goes, he was threatened by them and told to cease and desist. And this has caught a huge amount of interest all over the world. Literally, there are over 100 people here in the United States dedicating all of their time and resources to 
finding out how the Joe cell works and why it functioned and why it was able to run this and why they would threaten to shut one person down for use, utilizing this on his car. And that, that, that really is uh, really what we're getting at here is why would, why would somebody stop a person from using a technology that very seldom works for anybody else, the only person in the entire northern hemisphere that can make a run, that's what we're going to get into. <clears throat> what really amazes me about the Joe cell is the fact that, as I said, there are over a hundred researchers in the United States alone, right now, who are working with the Joe cell, who are literally trying to create energy from nothing. They want to create a fuel to run a vehicle from nothing at all. There are easier ways to run a vehicle. There are easier ways to there are easier ways to generate power. There are easier ways to um, generate fuel. There's Brown's gas. There's electricity. There's hydrogen. All of these things are, are much easier ways to do this. Why has it captured the, the minds and attention of all these researchers? And why are these people so dedicated to this subject? Um, I'm going to illustrate why. When I started working with, the, with this technology, a friend of mine came to visit that I hadn't seen for a number of years. And he said, I'm passing through Colorado. Can I crash at your place? And I said, sure. And as we were sitting there talking, we were talking about what we were, uh, some of the things that he were, we were doing. He was a massage therapist. And I t he said, so uh, what have you been doing? And I, I, I almost started to say, he says, wait, I have to tell you about a dream I had. He says, I was in the dream. And I was dreamed I walked into this museum. And this museum was obviously in the future because fantastically amazing stuff were there being displayed as antiques. And the entire museum focused down on, on one little spot um, in the center of this museum. And there was a little device, and it was a thing that held liquid, and it had magnets in it, and it, and it generated energy, and, and it was what all technology was based on in the future. Doesn't that sound like an interesting dream? And I was scribbling down a rough diagram of what I was working on and said, uh, Joseph, does it look like that? And he said, well, yeah, what is that? <laughs> this, is why, this is why it has captured the minds of all these people. It is like a new quest for the Holy Grail. And we'll be talking about the Holy Grail a little bit later on, but it is literally the energy of the future. Okay? All right, so are we ready to begin the new quest? Oops. Are we ready to begin the new quest for the Holy Grail? Yes. Okay, let's go on. Do, 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 do. Okay. All right, what is a Joe cell? Now, if you look it up online, you will find the descriptions. You will find the stainless steel rings, tubes separated by spacers. This is a mechanism. The Joe cell, if we, <clears throat> excuse me, if we examine, my stuff is not coming up. It's okay. If we examine what it is, it is five or six concentric tubes of steel, of paramagnetic steel. They are separated by spacers, which are diamagnetic spacers, and they have liquid, water, in the center of it. So, and when you apply an electrical current to this, you have a magnetic field that is generated going through the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, going through the cell. As I said, this is the mechanism. This is a means to, <coughs> how do I make my pictures appear, or my words? Oh, there we go. I have to hit the other button. All right. It is literally a means to harness energy. That is what a Joe cell is. When we, when we run up against a brick wall and we can no longer move any further forward, we have to start examining why we were moving in the first place. When we were working with this, there were a number of situations, many times, where we ran, where, where, where we would discover something completely serendipitously. We would discover a, an amazing process or a, a, an amazing technique that, that took us leaps and bounds from where we were. And then suddenly, we'd hit a brick wall and couldn't go any further. And we discovered that, that those leaps and bounds that we had just, just gone through were just the, the initial stages, the, like the birth pains of discovering this. Then we have to go back to the very beginning and say, why did it work in the first place? 
So that's what we're going to do with the Joe cell here today. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Joe cell is a means to harness energy. And there's a big debate about what type of energy. And I, I don't want to go into hydrinos and, and all of the wonderful technical terms that people have applied to this because it really is confusing. I, I don't care about it. Um, because I operate on a certain, on a certain approach to, to reality. I believe in something called etheric light. Um, and this is supported by a number of researchers, but I operate on the belief that there is etheric light. It is a tangible substance that we can utilize if we have the right tools to do so. Now, last year when I gave my presentation, I started it out with the statement that the establishment will never discover, sorry, the establishment will never discover free energy as long as they believe that free energy is not possible to discover. So by believing and accepting the fact that there is etheric light, that I can utilize it with different devices, then I, can then I really can use that and utilize it. I'll leave it to the mathematicians and the physicists later on to figure out the mathematics of it, to figure out the formulas, to quantify it. Right now, I'm going to use it, and I'm going to talk about how everyone can use it. So, let us move on. Now, I've given everybody a little handout with, um, if you didn't get one, there may be some still in the box. Uh, these are rough outlines of the, of the slides, and uh, you can take notes on it if you're going to be constructing cells, or if you want to think about constructing um, or utilizing this type of technology, it's a good reference sheet to, uh, to go from, good base to start from. And then you can read the rest of the books and, uh, that are out there and, and, and have a little bit different understanding about what's happening. Okay, so we have our energy we are going to be utilizing is etheric light. So first of all, we have to understand how we're going to trap, eth how we're going to trap etheric light. This thing's weird. Please uh, bear with me here. All right, moving right along. Uh, references. I have a list of references at the end of the at the end of the presentation that you can all copy down. I uh, sorry they did not get onto the handout, um, so don't worry about the references that, as we're going through here. We create we capture etheric light by creating an environment by creating an environment structure or antenna that allows and encourages a continual flow of the ether. This is a picture of a Peter Stevens style Joe cell. <clears throat> so, oh, so, um, this is concentric rings of paramagnetic steel separated by what should be diamagnetic spacers filled with water inside of a glass isolation bottle, uh, vessel. Okay? A Joe cell is going to, as I said, going to allow and encourage a continual flow of ether or etheric light. And it's going to do this using water, shape, and resonance. And we are going to discuss each one of those and, and how to utilize those. And, then, and, we'll, and I have examples up here on the table. So here we go. All right. Why do we use water? First off, as uh, Dan Davidson said in his uh, lecture presentation uh, two years ago, Water, or excuse me, ether, I did the exact same thing that he did. Ether is hydroscopic. Ether is attracted to water. Ether wants to go to water. As a matter of fact, I have a friend who just proposed a theory. He's been studying this uh, almost as long as I have. He just proposed a theory just uh, recently. He said, what if, just imagine for a minute, that all life on this planet is in fact a, a pattern that was developed, an interference pattern that was developed by the etheric energy interacting with the water on this planet. Interesting idea. <clears throat> so, we're going to use water because ether is hydroscopic. This also explains why the ocean is a huge concentration point for etheric elements. Uh, I talked last year about uh, high spin or high energy elements that, that do not show up normally on, uh, on uh, regular spectrographs and such. Um, 
the highest concentrations of these are in oceans or in uh, places that used to be oceans, uh, uh, what are now deserts or, uh, um, or glaciers. <clears throat> The, the next reason why we're going to use water is it's very easy to manipulate the nature of water. And as we've seen already with uh, some of the other speakers, uh, water is actually starting to come into the consciousness of people as being more important than just something that we're going to hydrate with, which reminds me, I'm getting dry. So, and the third reason that we are going to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, use water is that once you manipulate the water, you manipulate its effects. And we've already had a speaker actually speak about um, uh, the Masari Emoto and his photographs of crystalline structures in water. And we know that <clears throat> if you simply stick a label onto water with a word on it, the water will pick up the frequency of that word. Well, further research actually found that it was not the label that went onto the water, it wasn't the word, actually. It was the emotion. It was the emotional content of the person that put it there. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Words, words are interchangeable. They are labels. They are manifestations of our thought, consciousness. What, what our emotions do is they go out into our reality and affect the reality, as evidenced by these, by these uh, photographs. This is another way to manipulate water. I put it in there because I find it very beautiful. But also, take a look at the spacings there. You see spacing narrow, spacing slightly larger, larger, spacing slightly larger, all ratios of how wide the, water, the waterfall is to its fall rate. Now, does that look, oh, whoops, wrong way. Does that look at all similar to that right there? These are patterns that we have to, dis that we have to start noticing. Patterns are how, we, are, are how we interact with reality, okay? We move through traffic by watching the pattern, the flow, or at least we should, by watching the pattern and flow of the cars around us. So we watch for patterns. So as we're talking about water, there are three different ways to manipulate water uh, that, that, I, I've, that I, I consider. Um, they're chemically, alchemically, and mechanically, and we're going to talk about each one of those. Let's see here. Am I missing something? All right, I want to uh, really quickly go back to just uh, really quickly go back to something. On your page, I have uh, I've down in the center of the second page, I have down um, what can kill a cell. Now, there are stories out there about utilizing these cells and <clears throat> they are really contingent upon the they are really contingent upon the mindset of the person that's using the cell, and so and so there there are these stories about people driving the car and saying a single word, and the the the, the vehicle dying because it was running on the cell. There are people that talk about charging their cell, and we'll get into that. We'll get into all of that. Um, for the people that don't know about that, we'll, we'll get there. There are people that talk about charging their cell, and if something happens, the cell will die, and they have to dump the water out and start all over again. There are a couple of things that will, what's that? Oh. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Um, there are a couple of things that are going to kill a cell. One is anger. Anger will kill a cell. We have been operating machine, Charging the water that you see out there, someone comes into the room with a, just, uh, they were angry at the world, they hated their mother, they were uh, not really happy with life, and we watched the power levels, literally, we had a meter, watched the power levels, and we could charge a bottle all day long and it would not shock you. Had to tear apart the machine, rebuild it, put it back together again with the right attitude, and boom, there it goes. So that is an absolute God's honest truth. Another way to kill the water. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'll just get right to it. Uh, we were working, and we could charge 500 bottles of water before we had to go to the before we had to recycle and uh, and start all over again. And we stopped working with uh, certain people, and we were suddenly able to charge over a thousand bottles of water. What was the difference? The difference was that the people we were working with were addicted to pornography. Yeah. 
So we were immediately able to start charging vast amounts of water by not working with them. It really perturbed me. People on the Joe Cell uh, forums will remember this. It really perturbed me when someone was talking about, yeah, I can get to stage three by watching porn with my cell, but I can't seem to get beyond that. There's a reason why. Because water is etheric. Water is filled with ether energy. And there are certain things that ether energy just doesn't like. Okay, let's get on to, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, let's get on to chemical changes in water. All right, it's kind of funny, when I read on the Joe Cell groups, the people talk about, oops, sorry. People talk about, um, I'm using this type of water, or I'm using that type of water, and they're all using horrible, horrible water. They're using distilled water that they buy in the store, which is leaching plasticine out of the uh, milk carton jugs that they put distilled water into or they are using city water, and they can't understand why they get this green scum when they're working with their water, or this brown stuff at the bottom of their, uh, at the bottom of their chamber. The original research on, on, the, on a Joe cell was done with beautiful mountain spring water, or well, beautiful spring water. And we will get to that later, because there's a connection. Just put that, click, set that on the shelf, and remember that, okay? As you can see, there's chlorine. Uh, some cities are now using hydrogen peroxide instead of uh, chlorine. It's, it's a good thing. It's still not, not fantastic. Uh, there's fluoride, which we love fluoride, right? It's good for our teeth. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I, I debated talking about this, but fluoride was what they put into the water at Dachau and Auschwitz to keep the Jews from rebelling in the, in the, in the uh, prison camps. That's why a handful of people could guard hundreds, maybe a thousand, thousands of people because those people were so doped up they couldn't even think about rebelling against those guys. Could have overwhelmed them by sheer numbers. But they had fluoride in their water and their brains had turned to mush. Get a water filter. I live in the mountains with beautiful spring water. It's interesting because when I come down and work with certain people in town, some, sometimes their brains are right on, sometimes they're just because they're, they just drink right out of the tap water. Water filters, British Birkfeld water filters, my personal favorite, are the best. But anyway, that's uh, blackberkey.com, by the way. Um, all of these things, all of these chemicals that go into our water change the crystalline structure. And we'll be talking about crystalline structure as I get into some of these, uh, these items here on the table. Um, all of these chemicals change the crystalline structure of water to something that is not beneficial to the body. And so I wanted to touch real quick on, on, a, on a method that is really phenomenal for, for getting rid of uh, uh, those chemicals as well as changing the crystalline structure back. This uh, is an interesting uh, device. It's found on subtleenergies.com. Once again, that'll be at the end of the lecture on the screen. Um, subtleenergies.com. This is an ozone generator. It, does not, it is not your ozone generator that you drop into your hot tub. It is an ozone generator that generates O17 at, a, at an insanely high um, uh, electrostatic voltage. It is bubbled through a tank, and by the way, this is mine waste that they were originally treating. Um, this mine waste was uh, from leach fields. They were literally uh, uh, had arsenic and all sorts of fun chemicals in it. The water from the, leach, from the mine waste would flow down through here. They would bubble it through these uh, bubblers. Now, it's interesting because when you use this type of ozone, there is literally a vortex created because the, the electrostatic pressure through the ozone is so high that it literally moves into a vortex. The water would then flow out here and into a big, huge vat of charcoal briquettes into a drain tank and flow off. Now, for all the free energy researchers out here, here's a great one. See this little grounding rod there? What they found was that this, uh, this rod, or excuse me, this, this wire would disintegrate. They had a little 12-gauge wire. It disintegrated, burned up, so they replaced it with an 8-gauge wire, and that burned up, and they replaced it with a 6-gauge wire, and that burned up, and they eventually got down to a wire the size of my thumb, and it got hot because of all of the electrostatics, the, the ozone interacting with the particulates that were flowing through that water tank, it was generating energy. And they had to ground it. They were just cycling this stuff to ground. Um, 
there's, there's something going on here. There, there's even more going on here. This, this stack of briquettes of, of, of uh, activated charcoal literally yielded more gold and platinum group metals than the mine was producing itself. But we won't go into that. <clears throat> All righty then. This was developed by a gentleman uh, and his story is on subtleenergies.com. Please, please read it because it will help you in all of your research, whether you're researching carbon arcs, Tesla research, Joe Cell, what, water treatment, whatever. So ozone of the right type is very good. Ozone of the wrong type is bad. And the other thing is, I, I have to say this, um, if you are bubbling ozone into your house to kill bacteria, um, one of the foremost researchers in the medical community has found that, uh, of ozone, has found that the, the safest way to do it is to bubble it through a bottle of olive oil instead of just bubbling it out into the air. You cannot smell the ozone, but it still kills the bacteria, and it's much more healthy for the bo human body. Because ozone is, it is a killer, it goes in, but when you bubble it through the olive oil, it's, it's, it's much more effective. I, I just had to say that. Uh, was there a question someplace? What's that? Do they need to be extra virgin olive oil? Extra virgin olive oil is the best, yes. Cold pressed? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do use cold press, but that's okay. Um, okay, let's move on. Another th way to, uh, to effect a change in water chemically is th through the use of the study of Ormus. Now, Ormus I, I was my actual presentation last year. It is high energy, high spin, monatomic or diatomic structurally rearranged atoms. They do not, for, uh, for, they do not show up as uh, regular metals when you look at them under an x-ray spectrograph, um, or in, in an x-ray spectrograph. Uh, for instance, gold uh, in an ormus state is actually either a white powder or a golden glass instead of a metal. It, uh, there, there are many things, it's too, it's, it's, I could uh, lecture for three days on that. Subtleenergies.com is the website to go with, <clears throat> excuse me, this is what my original lecture was on. This is a picture of, of, uh, of gold that has formed inside of glass, and they started out with glass. They have literally manifested, created gold in a microwave, of all things, utilizing nothing but glass as an input, okay? So this is the first real um, uh, or one, one of the most real and tangible evidences that, yes, um, you can manifest metals and you can manifest things that were not there to begin with. Let's see, where are we? Okay, so I, I, there's, a, there's a huge study in this, but what's really important is that we use lye to cause pH swings in the seawater or in the different types of water that we'll discuss later on, we use lye to cause pH swings. And when we swing the pH, we take it down to a very low pH and then bring it back up slowly. Uh, for Joe Cell researchers, it's exactly the same way as you utilize a Joe Cell. Uh, you, have different, you have pHs and you go through a pH pattern inside of the cell. So that's a huge subject to talk about and I, I won't get into that uh, very much right now. But it's a great field to study if you're studying anything from, like I said, Tesla research to longevity. <clears throat> Moving right along, and I seem to have lost a picture, but oh well. Okay, we're now moving on to alchemical changes. Now, I, I included the Ormus right before alchemical because the Ormus utilizes chemicals, but it is also an alchemical change to water. Alchemy, in my definition, is in fact a an endothermic implosive action. When you study alchemy, and I've been studying this recently, it's a fantastic field, it's really fun, really confusing, but hey, it's part of the adventure, right? Um, all alchemical processes are implosive. They focus their energy inward. They are endothermic actions, okay? They are not chemical reactions, so this mimics our natural environment. This actually mimics our world. Um, are in Earth's natural forces. If you were to go to, let's say, Hawaii and study black smokers, which are essentially small volcanoes under the water, you would find that the heat inside of these things is, is absolutely tremendous. And there's, they're boiling the water right there. But you go five or ten feet away underwater, and the heat 
drops off completely. All of the heat is implosive. It is endothermic, exactly like what happens in a Brown's gas. Larry was demonstrating it earlier today. He's vaporizing tungsten and just completely destroying it. Brown's gas, indexing itself to whatever you put it against and destroys it. And yet he's holding on to the tip of the, uh, the, tip of the torch it's not burning him, and it, to actually measure it, the air around the Brown's gas uh, flame is only like 270 degrees. It's implosive action. It's going inward. All, all alchemical formulas are like that. So this, this brought, brings up another subject. Now, I, I love this subject, and anyone who knows me knows I cannot talk for very long without going here, is, uh, is, is, the, ancient, uh, is the ancient technologies. Boy, I tell you, that, that's a fantastic field to study. As a matter of fact, if you're, re if you're researching along, it doesn't matter what you're researching, if you're researching along and you hit a brick wall and you cannot go any further, pick up a mythology book. Pick up the Bible. Pick up anything that, that has nothing to do with what you're reading. Pick up something that will talk about what is done anciently, how they lived anciently, and you will start to train your mind to look in new places for answers and you'll start finding answers. Mythology books, they're like, they're like textbooks. Uh, or excuse me, they're like scientific textbooks. It's fantastic. When we start looking into the ancients, we start finding interesting things like the Baghdad battery. Now, what is very interesting uh, with, this, uh, with this battery that they found, and they found many of these uh, since the original discovery of the Baghdad battery, um, what they have found is that this area right here, this area was completely empty. This was um, just air, okay? It was sealed with wax and bitumen, which is uh, sealed with asphalt, essentially. It's a rod and, a, and a, a vessel sealed at the bottom, filled with acid, and it generated one volt of electricity. Now, uh, Mythbusters did one on this. They said, one volt of electricity, what could they do with that? This is debunked and uh, it's a myth. Well, one volt of electricity, that's somewhere around 10 amps. And you start putting those with a lot of them, what can you do? And Joe Cell researchers, you automatically, you, you can keep a Joe Cell alive, remember, using one volt of electricity on a leaky cell. So, what can't you do with one of these little things about this big right here? with a Joe cell. But what's real, more important is the shape. It's the actual shape. And when you study ancient alchemy, when you study, uh, when you study alchemical formulas, you find references to something called the anathor, as you see there. And this is essentially the same size as an anathor. This is a phyharmonically tuned vessel that is, it's absolutely amazing they would literally create reactions inside one of these that would become red hot, white hot, and become so hot that this would become transparent. And you could see the reaction going on inside. Now, this is not a myth. We have done this. We have done this recently. It's become so hot, it wasn't in this, it was in something else entirely, but it literally, you could literally see the action inside, but there was no heat escaping, and the vessel held its shape, all because of the shape of the vessel. So it's interesting that the Hindus would say that the universe is an egg, okay? The universe is an egg in which we are constantly moving and traveling through. So this was a this is basically uh, an, an anathor, a small, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a small anathor. They had much larger ones. This is very interesting because if you were to boil, this is specially designed that if you were to pour boiling water into this vessel in just a few minutes, it would be ice cold just because of the vortex. Another gentleman was uh, standing up here. I, I really appreciate you telling me about this because he was standing here and he said, this, this is amazing, this, this is one of the most effective etheric energy accumulators, all based on the shape that it's in, right here. So, I hope we're getting some, I hope we're, we're getting some clues here as to why the, uh, why the Joe cell functions um, the way it does. This, by the way, is the modern version of the anathor. Kind of looks kind of ugly, that's titanium, by the way. We have to use titanium now because we don't understand the shape we don't understand the reactions that are going on there. Titanium is the only thing that will actually contain the reaction because it will boil through steel and all that fun stuff. So that's, that's an anathor now 
it's, it, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do it doesn't, uh, it, because it doesn't have the shape anymore. Okay? We, we, we lose something as we, as in, our, in our high tech world. We believe that we've got all the answers. And I could, just, I could go on for that for a long time. But we won't, so we're going to move on. Next thing that we're going to talk about al and with alchemical changes to water is lightning. Now, in our research into ancient techniques for transformation, not of elements, but actually, well, elements too, but actually of the human body, in our research into immortality, I love that, I love that word, um, we find references to lots and lots of lightning rods. Down here you'll see a picture of, of a Minoan temple that existed high in the mountains of, 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 uh, of the Minoan civilization was on Crete. <clears throat> Excuse me. These right here are lightning rods. Now, why would a temple want to attract lightning? Lightning kills people. Well, they were doing it for a very specific reason. Uh, interestingly enough, these are exactly the same type as, or same, same uh, shape as the uh, lightning rods that Ben Franklin told people to put up to keep themselves from getting struck by lightning. Exact same shape. We just, you know, we're now using it uh, uh, 3,000 years later. Great. Everything old is new again. All right. Uh, Joe Blankenship was here. Uh, I don't know if he's, is that you up there, Joe? Yeah. Okay, great. Joe Blankenship, um, sometime talk to him about the chamber in the Grand Canyon. Uh, we found a temple down in uh, southern Utah th that used to exist on a lake. The uh, suppliants would row up to this uh, temple and park their boats. We found the dock. We found the steps that they walk up to. Um, all of these things have in common is that they all used lightning for some purpose. And we, we came to understand why, but our, our real confirmation was when a friend of mine um, gave me an excerpt from the unpublished uh, book, the whole, or the un unavailable book, The Holy Trinity Sophia by the, Saint, by the alchemist Saint Germain. And one of the stages to uh, immortality was to bathe in water struck by lightning. But what's interesting is what type of water. He makes a very distinct um, statement that it must be beautiful mountain spring water or blue glacial water. Literally, I'll just jump to the end here, literally they were utilizing the lightning even in this chamber inside of a, inside of a mountain in the Grand Canyon, they were utilizing the lightning to affect a change in the water, an implosive reaction or an implosive action on the water and it affected the body that was saturated with it. Okay, so water in a cell is very important. You cannot use tap water. You cannot use deionized water out of the store. You cannot use distilled water. You must find a good water source, and I'll be talking about how to make your own water to do that. You must find a good water source. And you guys, if you're never gonna run a car on it, that's fine. I'm gonna tell you all sorts of other uses for a Joe cell in our, in our lecture, just, just so you know. So you're not saying, well, this doesn't apply to me. So anyway, let's see if I skipped anything on this one. Okay, moving right along. Oh, uh, those hieroglyphs are from the uh, temple south of here in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, that used to be on a lake. It's in the, the uh, uh, mountains south of here. I'm not going to tell anyone where they are. I'm sorry. Uh, it was interesting. Um, these are some of the few remaining hieroglyphs that were there. The last time we went there, it's on private property. The last time we went there, um, literally my sister and I were crawling around underneath these cliff faces taking pictures of the few remaining hieroglyphs and places in this temple site because the owners were literally standing up on the cliff ledge talking about how they wanted to uh, destroy the rest of the pictogram so people would stop coming on their property. So um, these are fun, some of the few remaining ones. There used to be hundreds. Uh, over the past several years, they have all been destroyed except for these and, and a few others. Um, this literally talks about a vessel, a chamber, that's a symbol for gold. It is also the symbol for light or the sun, giving you through birth, or excuse me, through burial, it, resurrection, eternal life. Um, there's more to it than that. You can actually read these petroglyphs five different ways at least that we've documented. A spiritual, 
a, so, uh, a, a social, uh, a scientific, so, and, and alchemical, actually, we've discovered. So uh, there's at least four or five different ways to read these writings that all make sense, um, and you can apply it to any one of the writings. But it's absolutely beautiful. We were um, able, I said this last year, but I'll say it again, we were actually able to go, it was the middle of the night, a friend of mine and I got on, uh, went to this place, and we drank of this water that, that we now make now, that we learned how to make from this whole temple site, um, we drank that at the very spot that the initiates used to drink, drink it uh, 4,000 years ago. It was an amazing experience, very beautiful, but very spiritual. Uh, that, by the way, is my daughter. She wants to grow up to be Laura Croft. I'm fostering this because she will discover things that, that we have just not even dreamed of. So moving right along. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another thing that we start to find when we, uh, when we research... Uh, 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 Joe Cell Technology, and I'm just going to borrow uh, this one right here. This is by a gentleman, this was developed by a gentleman in the, in the audience, and it's a great illustration. I do not use this style, so I didn't have one to bring. This is, these are concentric rings of steel, paramagnetic steel, separated by spacers. And when we start studying Joe Cell Technology, we find that the Joe Cells have to be shiny. They have to be diamagnetic, and, <clears throat> excuse me, there is something else that we all should be acquainted with that is exactly the same way, and that is Cloudbusters. Now, originally, we all think of Cloudbusters as being concentric, or excuse me, grouped tubes, but what's interesting is that those tubes have to be phiharmonically balanced by length to width. They all have to, they have, to have certain ratios that you utilize them in, and the original um, the original Cloudbusters were not grouped tubes. They looked more like that with spirals in them and the variations on that. You can actually make a Cloudbuster exactly like you make that if you make it phiharmonically balanced to length and widths. And they are incredibly effective. Uh, they can do amazing things. There's a gentleman here in the audience. Um, you know what, I'll talk to him later. I don't know if he wants that brought up, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> so, Joe Cell, uh, can we have the picture? Thank you. Um, Joe Cell technology relates to Cloudbusters because we have the shiny concentric or grouped pipes. Once again, they are also diamagnetic versus paramagnetic. We have a paramagnetic metal. Oh, by the way, I need to define those terms. I, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> in, in, uh, before we had the current table of elements, we used to divide up our, our elements into three groups. We had magnetic elements over here, or excuse me, we had diamagnetic elements over here, which were elements that were negatively affected by, uh, by magnetic fields. They try to move away from any magnetic field. So the most, the most diamagnetic element is bismuth. And that is really fun to play with if you, I mean, you could devote months and months and months of study to bismuth. Bismuth is, um, bismuth literally converts heat differentials into energy, uh, literally power. Um, there are many applications for that. It, we have differentials all around us. We, we have uh, heat differentials. We have all sorts of differentials. Bismuth converts that into energy. So bismuth is the, the most diamagnetic element that there is. So we have diamagnetic elements over here. We had paramagnetic elements over here. Paramagnetic, I believe, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, paramagnetic elements are elements that do not respond to a magnetic field unless they are under, <clears throat> excuse me, under an electrical impulse or under electrical uh, current. And then we had magnetic materials in the center. This is how it used to be divided up. And what's interesting is this was before they discovered the, the, uh, the um, noble gases. The noble gases then go right, click, 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 right into the center between the diamagnetic, the paramagnetic, and the magnetic elements. So those are, the, those are some definitions for you for, for paramagnetic versus diamagnetic. We are paramagnetic beings. It's interesting. Concrete that we walk on all day long, that's diamagnetic. You put a paramagnetic shield between you and the concrete, suddenly you have increased energy. Um, if you were to set a battery on concrete, the very crystalline structure of the diamagnetic concrete would suck the life right out of the battery. Same exact thing happens with the water. If you set the water on concrete, it just suck it right out because it is the antithesis of what we ourselves need to operate at. So, and then we go out and we build buildings out of diamagnetic material.
kind of defeats the purpose of life, doesn't it? Okay, so now we've got a definition for paramagnetic versus diamagnetic. And you'll notice in your handout, I have it in many places. I cannot stress enough paramagnetics versus diamagnetics, okay? The other interesting thing about uh, Joseph, okay, so um, par uh, cloud busters, we have, a, we have a metal here. We have a dissimilar, you can't see it, but we have a dissimilar metal inside of uh, resin down in the bottom. So we have a differential once again. We have a differential between the metal of the pipes and the metal inside of the, in, inside of the bucket. And so when these are properly utilized, grounded into water or, um, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically into, you need to have it into flowing water because if you ground it into regular water, uh, excuse me, if you ground it into standing water, it will corrupt it with the, uh, with the energy that, it, that it's cleaning out of the skies. So flowing water works best. Uh, but it will cause an etheric draw. And there are people that say, well, it's not etheric, it's, it's ionics, and there's, there's ion flow. And, and no, we, we've done experiments where we literally caused a, an etheric cascade, and Mother Nature tried to breach the hole in a very violent manner uh, using one of these, one of those, and another machine. Um, so it is literally ether energy, and it is flowing this way, and an ether energy that is flowing with, from a, a, powered by a cloud buster is pulling everything with it, so it's pulling all of the, the, uh, the toxins out of the air, and that's why it cleans the atmosphere, or one of the reasons why. Um, so think about this, uh, this grounded to, uh, into water to, actually that should not say collect, I apologize, that should say to eliminate the energy. So gel cell people, that cell has to be completely isolated from the metal of your car, okay? Because otherwise, all of the etheric energy that you are actually producing, all of the etheric energy that you're actually drawing, is just getting grounded out into the metal of your vehicle, okay? The problem is that we're still plugging it into the negative pole of the, the alternator, and that's grounding it out too, because the negative pole is still ground, is connected to the chassis of your car, okay? Just FYI. All righty then. Oops, thank you. All right, there is a connection here, and I love this, uh, I love this connection because, like I said, I study ancient, ancient archaeology and such. This is a work done by Phil Callahan, and I know that Joe Blankenship has brought this up uh, several times. Um, Phil Callahan is a genius. He is an absolute genius. If you ever find Dr. Phil Callahan's works, pick every single one of them up you can, pay as much as you can. Um, when he dies, the world will have lost one of the most brilliant minds that there is, okay? So study his works. He documented that the ancient Irish towers, a, a connection between the ancient Irish towers and the Egyptian obelisks. These were paramagnetic material, and this is a picture of one. These were paramagnetic materials that formed into a specific shape, started to affect they would actually affect magnets, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, talk about that in just a second here. But they would affect the air around these and the ground exactly like a cloud buster does. It would literally clean the, and these were put up before the pollution and such, so literally it would energize the ground with a positive life force energy, and the ground around these would just thrive. And in Egypt, there are no Egyptian obelisks where they are originally. Nearly every single Egyptian obelisk has been moved sometime between the time it was put up and now, and most of that happened within the last 200 years, okay? There are no Egyptian obelisks that are even standing exactly the same way that they were. All of the Egyptian obelisks that exist now are standing on some type of firm foundation, whereas originally they were standing on a foundation of their same type of material in a way, oops, can I go back? In a way that grounded them out, nope, it's the wrong way, um, just like a cloud buster had to be. These Egyptian, these Egyptian obelisks, while not affecting so much rain, they would literally affect the ground and allow these plants to grow because it infuses the ground with paramagnetic energy, okay? So, we, so once again, we're coming back to paramagnetic versus diamagnetic. We're running into differentials in energy. Where, where does that, uh, think about that, think about where that is going to take us. 
What, we, what else we find with uh, Dr. Phil Callahan's work is something really astounding. And this is, uh, this is worth every single penny, every single one of you paid to get into this lecture, okay? And I've talked to a few people and told them about this, but I'm going to tell it to everybody now because everybody needs to understand this. Um, and you may not understand the implications of this for a long time, but, but listen to what I'm about to say. Paramagnetic materials changed based on geometrical structure alone. So, oh, I got to tell you this neat little story. I learned about this, read the book. The very next day, the very next day, I took my daughter, uh, Sage, the one in the picture, to uh, the science museum up in Denver. And we were waiting in line to get into the Science Museum. She loves it. She goes to see the Egyptian display. She likes to see the Native American displays. Uh, really fun stuff. We were waiting in line, and there was this little kid about this big waiting in line with his family in front of us. And he is standing there with, I kid you not, this in his hand with little fins off of it as a rocket ship. I said, wait a minute, that, uh, you know, I'm catching it out of the corner of my eye. I said, wait a minute, that looks really familiar. And this kid is flying it around. And I look at it, and it, this one isn't even completely accurate. His little rocket ship even had the windows of this tower in it. And I knew right then, I knew right then that I was being led to an answer about paramagnetism. That night, I learned about magnetic... Uh, magnetic resonance and the importance of magnetic resonance in our lives. Uh, I, 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 we haven't figured out exactly everything about it, so I'm not going to talk about it, but, but think about that in your life, magnetic resonance. That little boy was like, almost like a, a serendipitous messenger saying, you're on the right track, go with it. So, let's see if I'm missing anything. Any questions about this so far? <laughs> I have seen convincing evidence in the past six months that, um, you remember uh, uh, Jules Verne? Jules Verne wrote um, From the Earth to the Moon way, way back when. He had uh, pinpointed Cape Canaveral to within, I think it was 50 miles. He knew exactly where, or knew almost exactly where Cape Canaveral would be. He even had a launch trajectory, and this is the 1800s. Um, I've seen convincing evidence, mathematical formula that says we launch at that spot to get the, at a specific time to get our rockets into a specific spot that then levitates it out of the orbit, or out into orbit. So, um, and I'll get into Lead Scallon too. Lead Scallon talks about uh, rocket ships and how to, and how to uh, go into space, but it, all, it does. It comes back to paramagnetism and diamagnetism. If we understood that paramagnetism and diamag it, the, the principles of that, we could literally have a, have a device that resonated so much paramagnetic energy that it would launch itself away from the Earth. Because remember, uh, excuse me, not paramagnetic, diamagnetic energy. Because remember I said diamagnetics repel away from any pole of the magnet. And so if you had a device that was supercharged with diamagnetic energy, it would literally just launch into, into space because it's trying to get away from the Earth. And then, theoretically, if you could resonate it with the paramagnetic energy of the Earth, you could draw it back no matter where it went in the universe. But those are, that's all speculation. Anyway. Diamagnetic and paramagnetic again? Okay. Um, paramagnetic is... Steel, for instance, for example, steel that is not magnetic in and of itself, it will not stick to a magnet, and yet um, if you put a, a current across it, then it, be, then it will become magnetic, just like a, just like a piece of, co just like a copper winding, okay? Um, paramagnetic is materials that will, that if this was a magnet, it will move away from a magnet. Oh, sorry, diamagnetic. Thank you, I apologize. Um, diamagnetic. So here's the secret. Paramagnetic ch materials change based on geometrical structure. This is a piece of sandpaper. No magnet will stick to it, and yet if I were to suspend it by a string and move a magnet close to it, it would move towards it based on its geometrical structure alone. Okay? 
This happens on a macrocosmic scale with this, with that tower. It also happens on a macrocosmic scale. If you're to study bismuth, you would under, uh, I, I can't tell you about the studies in that, but I can tell you that study it, and you will discover that magnetism, paramagnetism, conductivity, and this is in your notes, conductivity and superconductivity all are contingent on the geometrical structure of the element that you're working with, okay? Uh, bismuth turns heat into heat and cold into energy based on its structure. A superconductor will conduct energy based on its crystalline structure. A magnet is a magnet because of its crystalline structure. You take away its crystalline structure, it's no longer a magnet. You give it back its crystalline structure, it's a magnet. Okay? This is one of the most important things that you will ever realize if you're going to build a magnetic motor, if you're going to uh, build something that's going to energize your yard, it all comes back to geometrical patterns. Okay? Our thoughts are geometrical patterns. Remember how I said, I put up that picture at the very beginning and said, I want to, I want to imprint everybody with a, with a thought pattern. Okay? Literally, that thought pattern, that thought in your mind is going around creating a geometrical pattern in your thoughts. In your, in your head, yes? Is that what a chemical reaction is? Yes, chemical, chemical reactions are also geometrical patterns too. And I'm go, I, I, I should have brought that up then. As we, change the, the, uh, as we change, as we input chemicals, we add more and more complex patterns to our water, and that is what causes the, uh, that's what causes the, the harmful side effects of water. I will show you um, in a little bit, uh, water that is so high pH, it would be like drinking lye, and, and yet I can put it on my hands and splash it on my face, because the geometrical pattern is not such that it would destroy me. The geometrical pattern is such that it actually is beneficial to me, okay? It all comes back to patterns. It all comes back to how things move in the universe. Yes, sir? Okay, that works. Yes? And I bought the, the Stover book on magnetism and it helped me to understand uh, that there were these other forms of magnetism that were not ferrous magnetism. That's great. If, if, you want, if you want to call it non ferrous magnetism, that's fine. Um, I, I refer to it as paramagnetic in honor of Phil Callahan because he, while he didn't coin the term, he did do all the major research in paramagnetism and why, it, why it's beneficial for the body. So uh, let's take a look at magnets really quick. Um, para uh, magnets versus paramagnetics. Um, it's been documented over and over again that if you take a, a south pole magnet and put it on a, uh, let's say, oh, I, I love this one, a, a little styrofoam container of, of bait worms, they will start to literally become carnivorous and eat their way out of the styrofoam container. However, if you flip the, uh, if you flip the magnet around to the north pole side, it won't do that. If you put live blood analysis, uh, I talked about last year, dark field microscopy. If you put a, a piece of your live blood on the, on the slide and you pass a south field magnet across it, it will kill the blood. It will just destroy it. That blood is, is not functional. If you switch that magnet around and, shine, and put the north pole magnet against it, it will be beneficial to the body. Okay, so you have to be careful about magnets. Paramagnetic is, not, is, is, is completely different. It's literally um, exactly like us, so it gives us energy. You don't have to worry about poles. Yes? Can you comment on uh, scalar versus paramagnetic um, I don't quite understand what you're saying, but I will get into the scalar standing wave in just, in just a minute, okay? Because that, interestingly enough, relates to the... Uh, Relates to the Joe cell. Okay, moving along. Am I making sense? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, the next thing that we come to in, into, uh, in, understanding, um, in understanding the Joe cell is uh, Leed Scalman's work. Now, for those of you who are not aware, Leed Scalman was the gentleman, Edward Leed Scalman was a gentleman who created Coral Castle. Um, he, by himself, little 100 pound dude, uh, moved blocks that were in excess weighed in excess of the largest blocks used in the Great Pyramid. Moved them all by himself, carved them all by himself, did absolutely amazing things, and he wrote a little booklet called Magnetic Current. It's one of the strangest books you'll ever read. It reads like it was written by a fourth grader. Terrible punctuation, bad spelling, 
Um, it's also one of the most heavily encoded books and one of the most important books you could ever read in your life because it teaches you about magnetic resonance. This book was written in, nine, in about the 40, early 40s, right when the establishment was changing all the books about magnetism, okay? If you get books written before 1940, 1950, you get a truer understanding about what magnetism is. For one thing, dowsing was an accepted science before that time because it had to do with magnetism. After that, they changed the idea of magnetism. Dowsing became fringe science at best, witchery at, at worst, because they didn't understand it anymore, okay? So, uh, to talk about Lead Skelman, one thing you gotta understand about Lead Skelman is, he said that there are three things in the universe, okay? Um, he said that there are three things in the universe. There is light, which is the neutral. There is north poles, which is the, uh, which is the positive energy. And there are south poles, which are the negative energy, okay? He literally talked about um, being able to trap light, and we're getting back to the etheric light that, that I mentioned earlier. He talked about being able to track, uh, trap light, affect the nature of reality, how he carved those stones all by himself with, with a minimum of tools, how to trap light and affect gravity, which is how he moved 100,000 pound blocks by himself without any, without any lifting apparatus, and a number of other things that we won't get into now. Um, the way you do it, if you, if you were to shine a light, a, a laser on a, on a mirror and then have another mirror over here, you would catch the light, bounce back and forth, and pretty soon that light would get really tired and disintegrate or uh, lose its energy. Well, he said you trap light using an infinite number of 180 degree planes or a circle, exactly like this. Actually, it's more like, don't bring them up, I'll just walk over. Actually, it's more like this, nice and shiny inside. We're literally trapping etheric light utilizing the, the shine. And there is a conventional scientific establishment uh, parallel to this, by the way. It is the uh, um, it's radiation shielding material. I, I, I didn't bring it up here, but if you can imagine a roll of toilet paper stretched out along the ground. Um, Instead of being toilet paper, it's uh, micro-thin glass. And it is heated and then rolled. And you have literally hundreds and hundreds of layers of this very, very thin glass. And it comes back and it's about the size of a shot glass. Okay? It's radiation shielding material. The radiation, let's say it's this. The radiation comes in, goes through the glass, and goes through the spirals of the glass until it's literally trapped in the center and dies. No fuss, no muss, no heavy lead, it's literally little shot glasses, hollow shot glasses, and that blocks radiation. Very interesting, uh, interesting radiation shielding material. Okay, we have got to move, so. Um, Lead Scounder also gives you the uh, answer to the burning issue of positive versus negative electricity. For those of you um, who aren't aware of the, the Jocell uh, issue controversy right here, um, they say utilizing uh, negative electricity, literally connecting the negative pole of your alternator or your battery to the, uh, to the device and then tapping it with, uh, for connecting the negative pole for a while, several minutes, and then tapping it with the positive to encourage the energy flow. That is absolutely correct. As, um, may not be correct in implication, but it is correct in the fact that negative and positive are completely different. We are not set up to measure one half of this. We are only set up to measure both negative and positive flow through, the, uh, fl through a wire. We are not set up to measure the negative energy alone. So I have literally seen, utilizing this concept, two pieces of steel slapped together like that with a little groove in the center, run a wire through there, you attach the negative energy to it, and this is, there's, there's a process to this, there's a device that will do this, but um, you attach the, attach the negative energy to it, charge those two plates, pop it with the positive, and those two plates, which were paramagnetic steel, suddenly become neodymium magnets, practically, so powerful. A one-inch square is so powerful that I can't pull it apart. It'll support my weight. Who knows how big a, 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 you know, a, a, a 
20, 30 square inch uh, plate, will, how powerful that will become. Uh, they're now making safes out of this, by the way. Real cool stuff. Um, so <clears throat> negative electricity is absolutely correct. I utilize this when I utilize my cell. Um, I, I have my doubts over whether or not you can utilize negative electricity utilizing a, uh, uh, an alternator. Um, what we found is that we had to use a battery, not a dry cell battery. We literally had to use a wet acid battery. Mother Nature is not dry. Water is where it's at. We literally had, in order to utilize that, uh, that process, we could not use uh, generated electricity. We had, to use a, we had to use a liquid source for energy. So my, my contention with the Joe Cell people, just FYI, is that you cannot, utilize a, uh, you cannot utilize just the alternator. You have to utilize the liquid source of, the, of a battery. So that's, and that's based on my work and, and, and what I do you know, every day. So, moving right along, we also have mechanical changes to water. And there are a number of different types of uh, ways to mechanically change water. And what are we doing? We're changing the crystalline structure. So what we have here is an autoclave unit. <clears throat> this is my backup. I didn't bring my real one because there's uh, been heavy modifications to it. So, <clears throat> this is a pressure vessel. And as you can see, this can handle a huge amount of pressure. It's also shiny inside. Oh, thank you. You're right. Um, whoops. Uh, it's okay. I've got to show. Okay. Okay, mechanical pressure changes to water. We have pressure. We have cold. Cold, freezing water, and then and then bring it back to room temperature will also change the crystalline structure of water. Um, some of the purest, best water in the entire world you can get is from the bottom of, uh, or excuse me, from the cores of glaciers and, and icebergs that have been uh, very, very cold, oops, sorry, have been very, very cold for a very long time. It's so rich in minerals that it's, it's, it's life-giving just holding the bottle for crying out loud. Um, and I mentioned both pressure and cold in the same, uh, right next to each other because uh, there's a work being done pulling up water, a very special type of water. It's, uh, it, it's, it's H3, it's, it's uh, helium-3, pulling wa uh, water that is so rich in helium-3 out of 35,000 feet down in the ocean, very cold, as cold as you can get with water without freezing, and under incredibly high pressures, more pressure than you could possibly generate up here. Well, I, not quite, but um, a hugely a huge high pressure. And they're pulling this uh, water out and doing phenomenal things, superconductivity, um, uh, uh, even uh, um, bucky tubes, um, uh, monofilament nanowire. Uh, they're, making, they're, they're using that to make that stuff. And I've actually seen it. It's indestructible cloth. In 10 years, we'll have clothes. You put on a pair of jeans. You'll be wearing armor. You put on a sweater. You'll be wearing a bulletproof shirt. You know, It's fantastic. Um, other ways to change water. And this is really, really important. Um, these are vortex water devices. The water flows in through here, and you, due to a, 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 a slit that I cut into the uh, plastic in here, the water then flows in a vortex. And the water flows in a vortex, moving around like this, until it hits this thing. And my, my, my real one fell out, and so I had to throw this one in there. Um, but it hits a, a cone on this side, and actually reflects a certain amount of the water back up the tube out this end. On this end is a, is a, is a cloth that blocks, um, that blocks the flow of water. If you dip this cloth into water, you'd pull it out and it would be dry. If you dip it into oil, it just sucks it right up. So this cloth blocks the flow of water, but what you get out through that Schauberger-type vortex is an oily water, which is highly charged, highly energetic, and this is really what you should be using in there if, you, uh, if you're so inclined. Um, theoretically, you can drink it. We've got some right here. Trap water. There are many different types of traps. Uh, I can talk about how to build these at the table when we get done because apparently we're kind of running out of time. This is my favorite type of trap. Oops. That's supposed to be down there. Water flows in through the top here. 
spins in a cyclic vortex in here. Now remember, we're, all, we're, talking, about, um, we're talking about how things move. This literally structures water and you capture a certain amount of, a certain type of the water down here in the same type of cloth that is in the center of that, uh, in the center of that vortex. All of the water in there is captured as a, um, as a high spin superconducting water. Now we know that it's superconducting because one of the very interesting side effects was we took this thing apart and started using it to uh, distill salt out, uh, or excuse me, evaporate salt out of, uh, out of salt water so that we could have nice pure salt to use. And what we found very interestingly was that salt was growing out of the side of the, the, the stainless steel container. Literally, salt crystals were not climbing up and evaporating over here. They were growing out of the side of the stainless steel. The steel had become superconductive, and salt was traveling through it. All, it happened to all of these things. It's uh, really amazing. We can talk about the construction of those a little bit later on. So we've got water that is, um, that is no longer behaving like water. It's, it's more like an oil. Use that in your Joe cell sometime. Another way to, oh, let me change this. Did I do that? Yeah, yeah, I got everything. All right, sound and resonance. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Sound and resonance is another way to change, uh, to, ch to um, mechanically change water. And when we get into that, what we find, once again, is um, we're, we're coming back to a relationship between, uh, between Joe Cell technology and, and something else. Uh, no, it's okay. Go ahead. Uh, the other one. Um, oh, where's my striker? Uh-oh. Let's see if we can do it with this. No. Dread it all. Ah! I can't, I, I need wood, I apologize, I don't have wood, but you can hear that it is a resonance chamber. This is what, this is another thing that the Joe cell actually is uh, operating on. Just like Keeley, who used sound and resonance to disintegrate water down to, beyond its molecular level, beyond its atomic structure, literally into its etheric gas form, we're doing the same thing with our Joe cells. We need to start utilizing these as a resonance chamber instead of, just a, instead of just an electrolysis chamber that we're trying to put electricity into and get energy out of, okay? Here are some examples. Thank you very much. Here are some examples of some other resonance chambers. Keeley's dynosphere, that's not tuned properly, that's why it's not turning, but we'll get there another time. That is a internal picture of what's actually happening is an internal picture of what's happening inside of the, uh, this device right here. As you can see, the Schauberger vortex that's going down the center of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pot trap, that is what it looks like as it's running. If you hook that up to a closed system, for instance, if you live on property and you can take your well and pump it right through that and then catch this water and put it into a holding tank, it's very effective. You can get a huge amount of, uh, of of effective high spin water for your, for your experiments. And I'm not talking about just Joe cell experiments, okay? I'm talking about any type of experiments. If you're working with, if you're working with Tesla coils, you can use water. Uh, you can use it as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a limiting resistor. You can use it for all sorts of things. Um, water can be used in, in almost anything that we're working with. We use water, we literally use certain types of water to recharge magnets that have died. You can recharge, put, put energy back into water using water, in a, or excuse me, it's putting energy back into the magnets using water in a vortex. Um, this is a picture, believe it or not, this is a picture of a standing wave, and I couldn't get any pictures of a, any good pictures of a standing wave in water. But as you can see right there, you have a vessel which has an, a closed side. You have sound input here and sound input here, and it's literally creating a standing wave of energy. This is the exact same thing in a scalar wave. It's just that instead of using water, we're using the energy in this vacuum, okay? Like Hartmut-Muller with, uh, with global scaling, and I'll get to that in, a, in another second here, um, 
the standing wave is everywhere in the universe. If we tie in, tie in with a Joe cell or some type of device, if we tie into that standing wave, we can have unlimited amount of energy. Just like Hart, just like Hart Mueller is now utilizing this to have unlimited communication anywhere. Okay? Let's go. Okay, so. Uh, I just wanted to demonstrate a few little, a few little types of water. You've all seen the shocking water. Check this out, out at the table. Um, this is all done with Joe Cell technology. This is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Ormus water. I talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, this was clear. Until we put in certain chemicals which allowed, the, um, which allowed the structure to change enough so that the ormus material comes out. And you take two drops or, or an eyedropper full of this, put it into a gallon of water, and water your plants with it. I had pictures last year. You, your, uh, your plants will grow tremendously. It will, it will increase the yield of anything that you put it on. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not brave enough to drink it. There are some people that do that all the time. Thank you. No. Um, this is another type of water. This is the water that we learned how to make at the temple site. This is Joe Cell Technology 2. Uh, talked, to, uh, talked to Joe Blankenship about, um, about some of his discoveries, but that water is literally, can be literally structured with whatever element we want to put into it. If you have a crystalline structure, you change the water and make it like that. Make it, make it exactly like that. You can taste it on your tongue. Every single element has a distinctive flavor. Gold has a, a very, to me, it's very sweet. Uh, platinum's kind of a, a, a sour flavor. Silver has another um, almost citrusy flavor. Every single element has a completely different flavor when, done, when taken through a, a, a structuring process uh, with the water. Now, nothing ever touches the water. It's all done with energy, but it's all contingent upon Joe Cell technology. This is that water I was talking about earlier. This is uh, registers on a scale of somewhere between 11 and 14. And no burning, no itching, nothing, because it doesn't have the chemical structure of lye, even though it's high, high, uh, um, even though it's high pH, it's not going to, it's not going to burn me, it's not going to hurt me at all. That's because we control how it manifests in the water, and that's all done with Joe Cell technology. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I heard something. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, I don't like my I'm I don't like stickiness on my hands. So, anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. Moving right along. Yes. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, let's see. Where were we? Where were we? Um, okay, so just to recap, real quick. We have concentric tubes of paramagnetic steel. We have diamagnetic spacers, and water, of course, is paramagnetic, acting as our vortex. Oh, drat, I was going to get into that. Oh, man, we'll have to talk about it at the table. I apologize. I was going to talk about uh, vortexes. Um, uh, you know, we can't get into that yet right now. I guess well, we're... I say. Um, well, I've got some more stuff to cover here real quick. Okay, so... We're already over on time? Uh, okay. It's a okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. We're not over on time. Because if they say we're not over on time. Okay, great. Good. We're not, we're not over on time yet. Okay. Uh, should when, we run to the table and get something while we're not no, over on no, time? No, 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 it's okay. It's something to explain. Okay. What's interesting is if you read Phil Callahan's work, it'll tell you about this. But in these towers, if you put them into water and put a magnetic current on them with a certain amount of, uh, with a certain amount of minerals in there, specifically sodium, um, you will actually find that the minerals start to manifest as a spiral in the tower itself, uh, excuse me, on, on the tower itself. So the, literally, the, uh, the elements will naturally gravitate in a spiral manner to specific places. Now, um, one of the things that I learned just recently on a trip to uh, Dallas was that in, um, there are, there's research now being done utilizing spirals. You know what? I don't need a prop. Never mind. Utilizing spirals in an energy vacuum, and they will input high voltage streams of electrons. And in this vacuum, they will naturally start to gravitate into a spiral pattern. Okay? The more they put in, 
the more, um, the more those electrons stack up until they are literally, I, I think they found, um, they literally found a 14, uh, 14 distinct spirals in the pattern before those spirals all jumped together into a knot and another one started to form and they would just keep on injecting these electrons into this uh, into this plasma vacuum chamber and they naturally they had no they had no mechanism to turn it into a spiral they naturally formed into this spiral and what they found was that it was incredibly dangerous because when they reached a critical mass this thing had a mind of its own and literally it shot out the end of the tube and it would destroy anything that it came in contact with but the interesting thing was that wherever it destroyed something, it manifested something too. So um, some of you, I, I talked to some of you about it. I, I, like I said, I love the ancient connection here. All right, they they discovered that this was a natural phenomenon that occurs near the pole at the very very high altitudes in incredibly strong thunderstorms. These lightning would manifest as a twisted, um, twisted knot that would literally rip out of the ground and dive into the ground. And where it dove into the ground, it'd leave a hole as if, as if a worm, a giant fire worm, had drilled into the ground. And where it came out were precious metals, literally um, raw, raw gemstones and precious metals. So where do we get, what, what do we get here? We've got Ireland, we've got the northern latitudes, we've got the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. We've got the fire worms coming out of the ground. Um, you know, if, if you watch the, watch the movie, The 13th Warrior, remember that was a true story. They literally expected to be going out and fighting dragons because they were in the northern latitudes. These things were fairly common in these, in these areas that they had massive thunderstorms, okay? Um, <clears throat> Going back to, so, so we're talking about making metals here. And I, I want to talk about this too. Oh, great, thank you. I, I, I completely did, forgot to touch on this. Um, two friends in Dallas, um, they took a Joe Cell type device. As a matter of fact, it was almost exactly like this one right here. So good job. Um, they loaded it up with water, but they wanted to see what would happen if they put in heavy minerals. So they had a very set amount of water that they put in, and then they added very heavy concentration of a liquid minerals into, this, uh, into the cell. And then they just put on as much voltage as they could handle without overloading their power supply. And of course, they're bubbling hydrogen off and they're making all this, you know, this scum on top of the water and they've got a whole lot of minerals. And pretty soon, all, pretty soon minerals start to drop out and short out, the, uh, short out the power supply down here at the bottom of the, or short out the power supply because it's so congested down here. Well, they're catching all of this hydrogen and oxygen. They're catching it all, and they recombine it back into water, okay? Scrape off the minerals, drain out this gunk at the bottom of this thing, put the water back in, and start all over again. And what they found was that they ended up with, the, using TDS meters, they found that they ended up with the exact same amount of minerals in the water that they started with, but they got minerals out here that they just skimmed off the top and drained out of the bottom, okay? And so they did it all over again. Boil water, or excuse me, uh, uh, boil the hydrogen and oxygen off, got a whole bunch of scum up there, the thing shorts out because there's a whole bunch of deposits down here. They drain it all out, sift it all out, pour the water back in. They got the exact same amount of minerals that they started with, and now they got twice as much out here. And they do it all over again. And they do it all over again. And they do it 13 times. 13 times the amount of minerals using the exact same water, the exact same, uh, the exact same amount of minerals to start with each time. And they just quit because they got bored. They manifested, they created 13 times the amount of minerals that they started with. So Einstein's equation, Einsteinian physics says we can take a small amount of matter, little tiny amount of matter, or a, you know, something like this, like a bomb, and we can create a huge amount of energy from it. But Einsteinian physics says that it takes just that same amount of energy to put it back in and to make a tiny amount of matter. But etheric physics, that uh, quantum physics, etheric physics trumps, trumps Einsteinian physics and suddenly we have a, an example of a very tiny amount of energy, relatively, a very tiny amount of energy going in and literally making matter from energy but it has to be in the proper configuration. It has to be in the proper way. So that's how, 
I can make this stuff, and somebody uh, goes and they, 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 put, they add uh, chlorine to it and a couple of chemicals. I'm not a chemist, so I, I don't know exactly what he did, and he gets gold chloride, and he's getting it from the water, and yet I didn't lose anything making it except water, okay, and a little bit of energy. That's why, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that is a possible explanation. I'm not saying that this is what's going on, but that is a possible ex explanation why the Joe cell is generating more than what you're putting into it because you've stored energy into it and you're getting hydrogen out to run your vehicle. Um, don't know, like I said, never seen a Joe cell work on a car, but I use a Joe cell every day to charge water and I've seen that I get a whole lot more energy out than what I put in. Don't ask me to generate, to, to make, a, to make a, 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 an electrical generator. That's not my deal, okay? Um, but it has to be in the right configuration. It has to be in the right, um, in the right state. Otherwise, it won't function properly. Okay, real quick, I want to um, tell you a little bit more about what's being done. Like I said, we charge water with etheric energy using Joe Cell technology. Let's see, what was the next... Slide. Okay. Um, we, we imprint water with, a signat with signatures of an element and it behaves as if it's the element. We also create superconducting materials. There's a gentleman now that uses this exact same type, same type of stuff, runs it through a process, plates it onto uh, electrical wire, and it becomes a superconductor, 0.000008 ohms. Okay, and he can wrap it into a coil, pulse it with one volt of electricity, and out comes 1.3 volts. Unfortunately, he's in bed with the DOE, so you know we'll never see that one. But <clears throat> there are many things that you can do with uh, with with water, and with specifically structured water. Now we're working with a. Uh, there's an organization called um, Tesla Communications International, and it uses water in a vessel. And what happens is we put a, a, specific, a specific amount of, plus of, uh, of structured, energized water with a specific amount of ormus elements to increase the conductivity, and it behaves like an antenna. We've got its range, a, a smaller one than this, we've got its range up to 25 miles now, broadcasting a ham radio, and we're getting better reception and using less power than an overhead radio, or re overhead antenna. So the applications for this are absolutely tremendous. I want to read something here at the very end of this presentation. Okay, so anyway, if you're using it to run a car or you're trying to use it to run, if trying to use Joe Cell technology to run a car, I don't know if there will be any success with it in the Northern Hemisphere, in the Southern Hemisphere. I don't know if there's any, going to be any success with it, okay? I'm not here to tell you that. I'm here to tell you that um, the Joe Cell technology is a tip of the iceberg when it comes to these future, when it comes to our future, okay? We have a device that is being, that is accepted as being a device that is contingent upon the mindset of the user, okay? It's contingent upon how the person thinks and acts and behaves. So that is the most important, we're moving into a new generation here. We're moving into a new, uh, a new technology and this is paving the way for it. So everyone that's working on it with a car, you know, that's fantastic. Remember that you are, that you are paving a way for something more in the future. And if, you, if anyone in here has said, wow, I am excited about this, this is really neat, I want to try maybe that communications thing, or I want to try the resonance thing, or I want to do something else with the Joe cell, that's really what I'm here to, to talk about, because this is, this is to kind of teach you the, the foundation. And I, and, we're moving ahead to, what we need to do is we need to take all this information, everything that, we've, everything that I've talked about today, everything that you know about Tesla and Schauberger and Keeley, put it all together in a whole and say, where am I going to take the technology? What we need to do is find a new way of utilizing this power, okay? We can, we can put it into a, into a motor, but honestly, that is like literally taking the, the antimatter warp core of the Starship Enterprise and trying to te run, a, run a technology on it that has not changed significantly in a hundred years, okay? That's next generation technology, or next generation power going backwards a hundred years to technology. You might make it work, but it's going to be a whole lot of hassle. 
Instead, what I propose is that we find a new concept for utilizing this, okay? And I want to, I want to read something. This is a quote from my friend John DePew. Oh, drat, I didn't even just talk about that. Um, he's got the Holy Grail, okay? Go to coralcastlecode.com. Um, as a matter of fact, let's, let's scroll into the references here real quick. Um, let's, this is one set of references. Copy those down. That is very important. Uh, let me read this while you're copying that down. This knowledge was first revealed in our ancient past, then suppressed again until people like John W. Keeley, Walter Russell, Nikola Tesla, Ed Leeds Scownan, and on and on tried to share it with us. And now here it is again, revealed again in our time. So please pay attention here. The truth has been revealed. Now teach your children and loved ones the truth so that they may have a bright and fru fru fruitful future. If we are wise, we won't forget or lose or ignore at this time. Good luck to all of you who have participated and who will in the future. Once again, thank you very much to everyone who is involved. Okay? Work on it. Move forward in it. Does everybody have this written down? No. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, which one? Organite is O R G O N I T E. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I don't know where that goes, so I don't trust what happens. Apologize for that one. <laughs> Apologize for that one. No, don't click on it. <laughs> I told you not to click on that. Oh, okay, good. We're all right. Deutschland, okay. Anyway. Let's, let's go back real quick. I want to explain each one of those links, okay? Okay. Subtleenergies.com, the most comprehensive and extensive library of Ormus high spin, high energy elements, uh, of information on high spin, high energy elements that there are. Uh, or Go Night, G O, talks about uh, Cloudbuster technology. Please visit that. Magnetricity. Um, John Maluski, Superluminous Light Theory, uh, talks about how we need to move away from elect, uh, electromagnetism and move to magnoelectricity, okay? Magnetricity is a really phenomenal site for information on, uh, on electricity and magnetism. This is sympathetic vibratory physics. This is uh, uh, Dale Pond's site on uh, John Keeley. If anyone hasn't visited that one, please go there. NeilSlade.com. Uh, that's, that's one of my favorites. That is a really fun and interesting site, really fun and interesting information from the Whole Brain Research Institute, a foundation established back in the 1960s, teaching people how to control their thoughts and move out of a, um, move out of a reptilian survival fight or flight mindset, move beyond just the mammalian, I'm going to nest and protect my home, move into your frontal lobe type of thoughts that teach you how to, how to, how to think beyond the box, think in creativity, create creative thoughts. They are not some type of anecdotal fun stuff. They are little exercises that teach you how to control your mind, okay? And once you can control your mind one way, you can control it the other way. So once you can live in your frontal lobes, you can then move back into your reptilian mode and your, your instincts are completely honed, excuse me, your instincts are honed and you have extrasensory awareness, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, Lead Skelnin is a group out of Australia, leadskelnin.com. They have actually uh, found a way to um, uh, utilize his techniques and actually demonstrate how magnetic fields and how electrical current flows in, uh, in wire and, and just in nature. CoralCastleCode.com. Um, everybody go there and email him and tell him that he needs to come here next year. Okay? This guy has the holy grail of free energy. I've seen it. It is one of the most, it was one of the coolest free energy devices I have ever seen. The only one that I've ever seen that, that I could actually say, yes, that's, there it is. It's spinning magnets. Um, can't talk too much about it, but literally, you got a set of spinning magnets here at a certain ratio, which actually fits with uh, phi harmonics. At a certain ratio, you have another set of spinning magnets here. Oh, this one's drawing a certain amount of power. This one is spun by that one. And then you've got another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. And I personally have seen 60 sets of spinning magnets all going at the same time, never drawing more power than the one over here, because all of those are tied in using the magnetic fields, the vortexes 
of magnet elect energy traveling through the universe. So it'll work right here, but it won't work two inches over, interestingly enough. Um, so it's literally mapping the magnetic fields that we move in every single day. Go to this site, it's phenomenal stuff. Uh, once, you figured, once you figure out the code, then you get into a, an even deeper site, and that's pretty cool. I mean, that's, that's even more amazing. So um, email him, tell him he needs to come here. He cannot give this technology away. It's disgusting. He has, it doesn't matter how big these magnets are. As long as you can spin them to the resonant speed of the first set of magnets, they will spin. Okay? And he can't give it away. He's called physicists, he's called electricians, he's called electrical engineers. No one wants it. Okay? It's a technique to travel the universe and all sorts of fun stuff. I, I'll just one more second here. Here's the next set of references. Oh, gee, I have magnetricity twice. That was supposed to be Mueller Power up there, um, company I'm working with at this point. The very last page of the internet, visit this and download this movie. Jerry Smith movie. It's Jerry Smith movies. Um, it will teach you how magnetic fields work. Magnetic fields do not look like you, 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 uh, when you stick a magnet with a bunch of iron filings and just, uh, you can't download it, it's, it's, uh, it's down right now for some reason. And it's, it's a movie, so it takes a long time. But anyway, um, go there because it will completely change your view of magnetism. Magnets do not move like that, like, like, like they show in an iron filing, that's what magnets stacked on top of each other look like. Moving magnets, magnets are constantly in motion. Magnets are constantly in a spiral motion, okay? Magnets are literally free energy, and if we knew how to, and if we could actually see that, as you will see in this movie, you will see, you'll start to see ways to generate energy just using a magnet sitting there, okay? Uh, Musari Emoto, I, I think I got that one right. Um, Messages from water, we talk about the emotional content of your thoughts going into water. Your emotional contents go into your thoughts in your body because you're 90% water. So you better start learning how to control your thoughts. Go back to neilslade.com. John Malusky, superluminous light theory. Light is, comes out of black holes, permeates into our sun, permeates into our, our skies, energizes our body. Uh, Phil Callahan by paramagnetism, like I said, one of the most intelligent men that there is, unfortunately. He can't remember it now. So um, Alex Schiffer, if you want to study Joe Cell, that's the starting place, the book. Uh, I, I don't think I spelled that right. And Carl von Rickenbach talks about how etheric energy flows and draws energy in through various um, paramagnetic, diamagnetic, natural, synthetic materials. All right, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate you letting me go over. Ladies and gentlemen, Vernon Ross. Thank you very much, Vernon.